It's a curious feeling to receive an email that says simply, I saw you speak last week, uh, you'd be perfect for a session we're doing on failure. <laughs> I, I'd really thought it was going well up until that point, but... Of course, I answered immediately, perhaps a little too confident. Very happy to. Failure's my middle name. It's a little too confident. It's also a little unkind. My middle name is my mother's surname. I've been thinking about failure a lot recently. This happens when you launch a newspaper in 2014. People will tell you that you're mad, and then they'll tell you you're doomed to fail. I used to think naively I was a cynical person. Among other things, launching a newspaper has caused me to discover what an incorrigible optimist I am. But failure, or at least the fear of it, is the thing that has most defined my life. It's plotted the course of my career. It's the grist to most of my decisions. I became a journalist because I thought, incorrectly as it turned out, that I'd failed to get into university. In those weeks after school finished, waiting for results, I became increasingly convinced that I'd botched my exams. When the Sydney Morning Herald called and asked if I'd like a job with them, I jumped at it, a folly of the then editor who had hoped that my total inexperience might pass for unique insight. And I've been terrified of failure ever since. It's a fear, I suppose, of being found out a little boy with little education in whom people put odd stores of trust. But the queer thing about this territory and this terror is that it causes me to do things ever more likely to fail. I wrote a book recently, a biography of Adam Cullen, and made sure the manuscript was due the same day as the newspaper I was launching started taking subscriptions. <laughs> Although in constant skirmish with a weekly deadline at the Saturday paper, I feel almost guilty that I'm not working on another project at the moment. I think of failure as a huge and inevitable boulder in front of which I'm always running, fearing it makes me get things done. The film producer, Margaret Fink, was one of the first people to call on the morning of my most recent birthday. The book I was writing was still not finished, and we were at the time keeping the newspaper a secret. She chirped down the line in that dry, blunt, 80-year-old, life-filled voice. If you haven't done something by the time you're 25, lovey, you never fucking will. <laughs> And it worried me. <laughs> These things always do. The strange thing about being young is being convinced you will run out of time. As my father once said, although I won't own to the compliment, we were all wunderkind once. I come from a family of Danes, and smiling is for the briefest months of summer. <laughs> and yet, we're living through a vogue for failure. Neil Gaiman wants us to celebrate it. The philosopher Daniel Dennett talks about making good mistakes. Opinion pages are clogged with peons to disappointment. Books are published with the most trite of subtitles. Why failing well is the key to success or creativity and the gift of failure. Spare me. I mean, really. really. Uh, it's worthy here, however, to draw a distinction. Some failures cut down brilliance. It can be ruinous and cruel. Most failure corrects folly, I think. But a fear of both kinds is sensible. I am without religion. The spectre of failure is my conscience. It is important, though, to fear it, not to celebrate it. At least this has been my experience. I was flying back from Tasmania recently reading a book of Richard Flanagan's essays called And What Do You Do, Mr. Gable? The collection takes its name from a conversation, likely apocryphal, between William Faulkner and Clark Gable, in which the actor apparently asked Faulkner what he did for a living. I write, Faulkner is said to have responded, and what do you do, Mr. Gable? I was reading in the book an essay Richard wrote after he directed the film of his second novel, The Sound of One Hand Clapping. The essay is really about the struggle between novels and film, the fight between them for primacy in a culture that is disappointed by the limits of each. Flanagan struggles with the act of making a film, the cyclone willed into existence in the eye of which the director is forced to live. Newspapers are a little like that, a weekly maelstrom, always slightly beyond control, at its most chaotic just before the landfall of deadline. In the end, Richard decides he's a writer. As an essayist, Flanagan is a writer of quotation. He has in his mind a great library of written truths and aphorisms. Reading him, I realized that while his film was a success, this was also an essay about failure. He quotes Carlos Fuentes to this end. We cannot live without the horizon of failure constantly in view. You see, failure and ambition are inextricably linked. They depend on one another. Each needs the threat of its alternative. Ambition without failure is fantasy. Failure without ambition is stasis. 
I wrote those two lines this morning, and I haven't uh, thought on them long enough to be certain they're true, but I was quite proud of the quite neat <laughs> inversion that they set up. Uh, a large projects are menaced by failure. Films and novels and newspapers. In all extinctions, the biggest animals die first. I was having lunch with Richard earlier that day, of cider and then Aperol spritzes and finally beer. We were talking about my Adam Cullen biography, about the anxiety that lives between finishing a book and seeing it on shelves. That anxiety is failure, or at least the fear thereof. Richard told me he thought his first novel, Death of a River Guide, had fallen stillborn from the presses. This feeling persisted for several months after it reached stores. It's now available in more languages than most people could count, let alone speak. My book is still on a ship floating somewhere in the South China Sea, hopefully coming. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's two months away from being on shelves, and, and, and I'm terrified. Um, because, you see, I don't have a story of failure, and every day that scares me. That's not to say I'm naive of failure. If anything, I think too much on its wreckages. I dramatise it because I don't know it. I don't know enough about it to feel at ease with its company. But I know it's coming. And I hope that doesn't sound like arrogance. It's not. I don't know what it's like to be mauled by a bear. Uh, but I'm scared of that as well. It's, it's not embarrassment that worries me. Um, I once impersonated an impotent construction manager while working on an investigation into a criminal medical institute. I came, uh, after a number of these episodes, to view journalism as a series of embarrassments above which you print your name each day. But what I do fear is the undoing of confidence, that failure might bring down with it the crippling sense of reality. The sense, or this sense, I should say, that failure is inevitable comes in part from the knowledge that I have too long dodged what is real. I think I'd like to finish this as Richard finished his essay. He chose from that storehouse of remembered wisdoms a line from the poet Robert Browning. Flanagan joked that Browning was forgotten except, perhaps, as the name of a pistol in a Tarantino shootout. Browning is not forgotten, of course, and nor is his line. A man's reach should exceed his grasp, or what's a heaven for? And for what it's worth, I'm also quite scared of heaven. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.